Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11 tells us that God's plans toward us are good and not evil, to give us a future and a hope. Here at Monroe Church of God, we believe in you. We know that God has a plan for your life, and that's why we're here, to speak that plan and that destiny into your life. We would love for you to be a part of our services here at Monroe Church of God in Monroe, Georgia. We're so excited about what God is doing. This is the church that love is building. The Bible tells us on the rock of Christ Jesus, he's going to build his church. And we're excited about what's going on here at Monroe Church of God. We're growing, we're seeing souls saved, lives changed, and we're doing that by three principal uh, things that we're holding on to, and that is that we are loving, growing, and going. That is, we're loving God and loving others with the love of God. We want you to know we love you. Secondly, we're growing together in the knowledge of God and His Word, and then we are going. This is a church that believes in reaching out beyond the four walls and sharing the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We'd love for you to come and be a part of our services here at Monroe Church of God. Every Sunday, we meet at 9.30 a.m. We have a second morning service at 11.15. Then we gather together at 6.30 on Sunday night. Also, we have a family worship service where our families come together and we celebrate the Lord Jesus. Every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, And we also, on Sunday night, have classes and youth group, all kinds of activities available to your family. We'd love for you to come and be with us. Call us. Let us know uh, that you're coming. We'll make a place for you. We're excited about what God's doing in this church and what he's doing in your life, and we look forward to connecting with you real soon. Let's go into the sanctuary now for a message that was preached recently here in the sanctuary of the Monroe Church of God. And I call you blessed. In Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and verses 3, that I've never seen before. Now, I'm going to get to that in a minute. I'm going to preach before I preach just a little while today. I, I, I want to speak to you today and trust God. I, I want God to turn my anxiety into passion. And I want to share with you, I pray, and the reason I'm anxious this morning a little bit is because God's been speaking this sermon, this message, this word to me all week this week. And every time I look at the word and God would speak to me what I'm going to share with you, I'm telling you God spoke it with clarity and with power. And so the reason I'm a little anxious this morning is because I'm flesh. The Holy Spirit spoke it to me. And I know if you're looking at flesh to speak it to you, it's not going to, it's not going to be as impactful as it was to me. So I'm praying today God literally hide me behind the cross. In the book of Joel chapter 2, it talks about loss, and God tells Joel, Joel to call a solemn assembly. And they call a solemn assembly, and God gives them the word that he will restore unto them the years that the palm worm and the caterpillar and, the, and all the other eating creatures had devoured. Now watch this. In Joel, God said he would restore the years now notice this, I've preached that and I got kind of messed up on it in the past. I'm going to have to go back and re-preach some sermons because he didn't say I'm going to restore the stuff. He said I'm going to restore the years. Somebody say years. It says nothing about stuff. He said I'm going to restore the years that the caterpillar and the palmer worm has eaten. Here's what I want to tell you this morning. You can get another job. You can get another girlfriend. You can find another church. You can get another pastor. You can get some more money. You can find another career, but only God can give you back time. You can, if you ruin your suit, you can go get another suit. You wear your shoes out, go get you another pair of shoes, but you can't go get more time. Only God can restore the years. And the word of God says, God says, he's going to give you the thing that was taken away from you that only he can give to you. I would dare say that everybody in this room has looked over their life at times and felt like you have lost some time that you wish you could have back. Yeah. You tried to be an adult too soon. And you wish you could have your youth back. That five to ten years you were strung out on drugs or you were drinking and you weren't living right. If you could, you'd like to go back and have those years back again. That time that you were working so hard and now your children are grown and you just wish you had more time. I'm facing that in my own life. I look at my kids about to go into the next season of life and I'm thinking, Lord, if I could just if I could go back and do, do it again and just have a little more time. If I could just throw the baseball in the front yard just a little longer. If I 
I could just have that time. Listen, everyone has a season of time that you wish you could retrieve. But listen to me. If God is your God, (laughs) if God is your God, you've really not lost any time. You've really not lost anything. And you need to quit saying you lost time. I've tried to tell myself, stop saying that you've lost that. Quit saying that because I don't want to speak out of my disappointments. If you're not careful, listen, you'll get hung up on that season of time. You snare yourself in your conversation and you get hung up on a period of, t- a period of time that you are wanting to come out of. Listen, you'll find yourself speaking of your past as if your past is in your present. But you've moved on. Even though your life has moved on, your mind has not moved beyond where you once lived. He says, I'm going to restore unto you the years that the the eating creatures have devoured. Restore, restoration means multiplication. God's not only going to give you back what was taken, but he's going to multiply that that was taken and give it back to you more than what was robbed in the first place. Well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That means if you lost your joy, he's not just going to give you back what you had. He's going to give you more than you had. If you lost your, fi- if you lost your business, he's not only going to restore your business, he's going to prosper your business. You see, G- God wants to give you an abundant supply. In the New Testament, in the book of Mark, Jesus told a man with a withered hand to step forward. Now, the Scripture does not say. I just saw this this week. The scripture in that passage of scripture of the man with the withered hand, it does not say the man was healed. Watch this. It doesn't say that he was healed. The Bible says, scripture says, that it was restored. I want to submit to you the possibility that he had no fingers, he had the possibility that he had no hand, that he had no lower part of his arm. I want to submit that to you. There was only that nub, and God had to restore it, not heal it. Why is that important? Because he had to bring it back again, and bring it back again better than it was before. God said to that man, stretch forth your hand. It's very possible the man didn't even have a hand. And by faith, he had to stretch forth and believe that when he stepped out in faith with God, that God was going to restore and bring to pass what was not even there and bring it to fruition where it was more than just another deformed uh, extremity, but God would restore back the very thing that was brand new, a new structure. Somebody say new structures. He tells the man, stretch forth your withered hand. Listen to this. First, you have to move forward. God told the man to step out of the crowd and move forward. If you don't listen to anything else this week, hear what this preacher is about to tell you. The first thing the man with the withered hand had to do was understand what we have to understand. When you desire something from your past to be restored to your present, God demands that you take a step into your future. Glory to God. You see, the irony of all this is when we want what's in our past, we want to go back to our past. We want to go back to that place. If we want to recover what was lost in our past, we want to go back into the past and get it. We want to go sing that same song. We want to go preach that same sermon. We want to go back to that same spot. We want to try to do the same things over again to recover it, what was lost by looking back. But God says, you keep moving forward into your future. And God says, while you move forward into your future, I'm going to reach with one hand back in your past, and I'm going to bring Bring it back over here into your present and into your future. God says that's why God has the authoritative audacity to say, forget the former things of old, for I will do a new thing, saith the Lord your God, and it shall spring forth speedily. You keep moving forward. Your eyes are in your head to look forward. Everything about you was created to move forward. Your nose, your face is on the front of your head to move forward. Your ears are created to hear what's ahead of you. Your hands are to reach to what's ahead of you. Your feet are created to move to what's in front of you. Don't look back. Paul said, forgetting the things which are behind. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Jesus, for the joy 
that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He moved forward to the cross, to the tomb, to Hades, to take the keys of death, hell and the grave, and ultimately to bring his power on this earth. Somebody praise God in this house. The fact is, if you go back to where you lost your victory, you're going to find yourself in the place you were when you lost your victory. There's a reason you lost it. If you go back to that place, you say, God, take me back to restore. No, God doesn't want to take you back to that condition where you got divorced. That's the reason you got divorced. You were in a mess. God doesn't want to take you back to that place where you stop being faithful to God because when you were in that place, that's the very reason you lost what you lost. So why would God want to take you back to the same place where you were vulnerable and where you lost it to begin with? Most people think that to restore means to get back to you, get you back where you once were because you've fallen behind it. But God, as I've said, God does not want you to get you back to where you once were because when you were there, you got robbed. God wants to put you in a new place. If God is going to restore your marriage, hear me this morning, he's not going to get you back to where it once was because the way it was, there was some holes in your armor. There was a crack in your shield. You left some doors open that needed to have been shut. And you shut some doors that should have been open. So God is trying to take your marriage into the future and say, stretch forth your marriage. I want to create a new structure. Mm. Maybe you're going to have devotion as a couple now. Maybe you're going to do some things that you didn't do back then when you lost it. God says, in order to bring restoration, I'm going to have to have you stretch forth And I'm going to have to create some new structure. Maybe you need to start praying together. Because you don't want to go back when you didn't pray. That's when you lost it. God wants to do something new. He wants to create a new thing. He wants it to spring forth speedily. Wow. Maybe your, your finances, you tanked and you filed bankruptcy. You don't want to go back to that. That's the reason you had to do that, because you had some bad issues in your past. You're stretching to the future, and God says, I want to create some new structures. I want to create a budget that you've never lived by. Well, I'm losing every bit of my amens right now. God says, you got di- now this is not true for everybody, but it's true for somebody. You got diabetes, and you got heart problems, and you say, I want God to restore, I'm going to go back and let God restore it. If you restore it back to where you're eating three hamburgers a day, that's what, call, you need some new structures. He wants you to do what you can do. God is there to do what you can't do, and he can do what you won't do. But God says, I want you to do what you can do, and when you do what you can do, I'll step in and do what you can't do. For God to restore you, you've got to let him build something in your life that the last time was taken away from you. If God restores your health, there's got to be a lifestyle structure uh, that you need to create that was not there when you lost your health. If God's going to restore your money, then that means he's going to create a new structure of management and budgeting and discipline. And you don't buy what you can't afford. Come on. Amen. You don't don't go out if you don't have groceries in the phone and buy groceries in the cabinet and buy a $300 phone. That's ludicrous. It's crazy. When you don't have gas in your tank and your kids are at home eating peanut butter jelly sandwiches, and you're shopping at the mall every Saturday and going out to eat and spending $50, $60. I'm telling you, I feel like a pastor in 10 months. I feel like I can preach this. That's crazy. God wants to create, and you're sitting around blaming the devil. devil didn't have nothing to do with that. Go with me to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. I want to read these first two verses, these second and third verses. It says, then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets. We're going to stretch forth. we got to have something to stretch forth to. (laughs) We can just sit around and say, well, praise God our visions come to church on Sunday. Well, we've been doing that a long time. What is our vision? Is it just to come and enjoy what's in the present? Is it just to come here and be here? Or is it to go there? 
Is it to reach the lost? Is it to go to the next level? Is it to take ourselves to the place that God has designed for us? Is it to go to the place we were created to be? I've said this multiple times even since I've been here at this church. I do not want to be 80 years old sitting in a rocking chair drinking sweet tea saying, what if? That's the worst two words I could ever imagine having to ask myself. I want to finish this course well. I've heard one of my dear preacher friends that's up in age, I've heard him say before, when I go into heaven, I want to be out of breath. I want to be working so hard for the Lord that when Jesus comes and takes me to heaven, I'm not sitting around just kind of coasting through. It was an 83-year-old man that told me that, that's still active and traveling all the time. He said, I don't want to go into heaven, just kind of stroll in. I want to be running into heaven when I go. (laughs) That's me. I don't want to sit back and always be regretting and thinking and strategizing and planning. I want to be walking in God's destiny for my life. Habakkuk 2.2. Habakkuk, before I read that again, Habakkuk and God are talking. Let me lay the foundation. God is saying that he is going to turn Israel and bring them back. But he's telling Habakkuk, that he's going to use the enemy to do it. Now, Habakkuk wants to turn around, wants the people to turn around, but he didn't want anything to do with that, that using the enemy. I've I've been writing a book for a long time, and I preach a sermon called You Have a Friend Named Judas, and I say just that, that God wants to use your enemy. Nobody helped Jesus fulfill his destiny like Judas did. God will use an enemy in your life to promote you. Your enemies create, or your friends create comfort zones for you. Your enemies create challenges and victories for you. Yeah, that's another sermon for another time. God's saying he's going to turn Israel around. He's going to bring them back. And he's telling Habakkuk he's going to use the enemy to do it, their enemy to do it. And Habakkuk didn't like his method, so he argues with God. And so he said, I want everybody to turn back, Habakkuk says, but I don't want to do it that way. I don't want the enemy to use the enemy to cause this turnaround. So God's telling him, watch this, when I bring change, sometimes change can be so difficult to make that you will lose sight of the ultimate destiny that I'm trying to get you to. The process becomes so cumbersome that you lose sight of the vision. So he tells Habakkuk, I want you to write it down so you don't forget it. Anybody like me, if you don't write it down, you forget it. That's what's going on right here in these first three verses. He's challenging Habakkuk and he says, there's going to be a time in the process that if you do not write the vision down clear, you're going to forget what the vision was because you're going to be overwhelmed by the process. So he says, I want you to write the vision clear. Write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. Now look at verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. Somebody say an appointed time. Now we've already established that this is our time. Somebody say this is my time. Yeah. So the vision is for an appointed time, but at the end, watch this, it will speak. doesn't say you'll speak. It says it will speak. For the vision, what's going to speak? The vision will speak. The vision is yet for, an, this is all important, to get every bit of this because we're going somewhere with it. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it shall surely come. It shall surely speak. It will not tarry. He said, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through change. I know I just read my text, but I'm really about to close. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through change. I'm realizing that I can't do things the way that I've always done them. You see, I, I, I'm realizing I can't make friends the way that I used to make friends. And I can't, I, I, I can't handle matters the way that I used to handle matters. As I said earlier, I've already, I've already lost too much time. I can't play games. I can't have friends going to stab me in the back. I need a witness this morning. I, I, don't, I don't have time for that stuff. I don't have time to waste another 10 years on people going to stab me in the back. I just don't have time for that. So I'm going to be more selective who I'm going to let into that place. I'm preaching to somebody this morning. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, the way I deal with things, I, I, I'm a young man, but I realize I don't have as, so I didn't get no amens on that. Y'all not talking to me. I, I, I'm a young man, <laughs> relatively speaking. And I, I look at, but I realize I, I don't have the time I had when I was 15 to dream. 
I, I don't have the time when I was 20 to, to have pipe dreams. I've got to focus my dreams. I've got to get my visions focused into what God is saying to me. I don't have time to play games. and I don't have time to, to mess around. I've got to get focused on God. What do you want me to be? And where do you want me to go? And what do you want me to do? And Lord, I'll be there. I, I don't have time to wait. I don't have time to figure it out. That's the reason I'm in Monroe Church of God. I'm coasting along in Trenton, Georgia. Everything's fine. God said go to Monroe. I said, God, I don't have time to argue with you. I'm going to Monroe. Amen? Even though I tried to argue a little bit. I realized I had to do what God told me to do because God's got to take me to a place that I know the end, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. I, I didn't know that God was preparing me 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago for today. I don't know today where he's preparing me for tomorrow, but I can't live back there. i got to look toward tomorrow. And i got to write my vision clear up on tablets. I, I, I'm making a change with the ultimate goal of God restoring my life, restoring the things that were eaten away. So what do I do? You've got to make sure that you and everybody and everything connected to you knows what the vision is. I'm not just talking about a church. I'm talking about you. You've got to make sure you know what the vision is. But God wants us to be disciplined. When I get up, Discipline. When I all day long as I'm going about my day, discipline. When I go to bed, discipline. When I start my week and go about my week, discipline. I wrote it down. I made it plain. Why? Because if it's not plain to you, how are the people connected to you going to be able to run with it if it's vague inside of you? You've got to write it down. You've got to understand it. And you've got to set it forth. Listen, when it tells you, and that scripture that you write it down so those who read it may run with it. Can I tell you what God is presupposing in that passage of scripture? There are already some people. Listen, I don't want you, I don't want to lose you. Listen, there are some people. God is presupposing that there are some people that need to be able to come into your life and by your actions be able to tell where you're headed. There are already some people that God has brought into your life for this particular season of your life. They're already around you. I stepped into Monroe Georgia in April of 2012 and there are some people in this city that God knew I had to get over here. Thank God for where we were and thank God for the wonderful blessings in Trenton. But God said I got to get you over to Monroe, Georgia. Where's Monroe, God? I didn't even know where Monroe was. God says, I've got to get you to Monroe, Georgia, because there's some people in Monroe that when you write the vision, thank God, when you write the vision clear, there's some people I'm bringing into your life and I'm bringing you into their life so you can write it clear and you can run it together. God has placed this congregation, the people that are around you now in your life, to help fulfill the vision he's placed inside of you. Because there's another word in the Greek that's the word ruach, which means the same thing this means, similar to it. The word speak, hear this, please. If you've, if you've been sleeping, nudge somebody and say, wake up, you've got to hear this. Speak, that word speak in that text, at the appointed time, it shall speak. That word speak. How does a vision, it says it shall speak, not you. It says the vision shall speak. So how does a vision speak? Speak Hebrew, puach. It means to exhale a sudden burst of air. <laughs> speak. You see, when God gives you a vision, I've discovered that you spend more time in the preparation of the vision than you do in the reality of the vision. It's like breathing in without ever breathing out. Pastor, for three years I've been paying my tithes. <gasps> I've been going to church for five years now. <gasps> I've been reading my Bible. <gasps> I've been living right. <gasps> and you just keep breathing in. There's no breathing out. And that's what life seems like. God gave you a vision. And you said, I'm trying to get to the vision. <gasps> Tithing, going to church, reading my Bible, serving, obeying. When I don't feel like obeying, I'm breathing in. I, I, I mean, those people that I should have left and I should have, I mean, they did me wrong. I've forgiven them. And you just keep, 
you keep breathing it in and you see the vision. <gasps> but the vision shall speak. <laughs> Let me remind you what's happening there. The Bible says that it shall speak. It means a sudden burst of air. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Keep on tithing. <gasps> Keep on living right. <gasps> Keep on having faith. <gasps> Because the vision is going to come to pass, and when it does, it's going to speak. Let me take you to the New Testament, Acts chapter 2. For 10 days they waited upon the promise of the Father, praying, praising, singing, worshiping, and suddenly there came a ruach. There came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. I come to tell somebody, keep shouting, keep praying, keep obeying, keep believing, keep serving, keep living right, keep forgiving, keep trusting, keep walking right. Quit, keep on doing the right things. Don't grow weary. God's blowing a Holy Ghost storm into your life. Come on. When everything you've been breathing in breaks loose in your life and causes to happen in one moment, what you've been breathing in for years, God releases. Let the people of God that have been waiting on something to happen, give God praise for 10 seconds. Let God breathe into your life. Thank you for joining us today here on Restoration Journey. I pray the program was a blessing to you and that it spoke into your life. That's our heart at Monroe Church of God, to be the church that love is building. I encourage you, if you have a need, a prayer request, contact us. Let us know. Let us join together in prayer with you. The Bible says where two or three agree as touching any one thing, God will be there. And so we want to connect with you. We want to pray with you. We want to believe with you. We also encourage you to come and be in church with us. If you don't have a home church, we'd love to see you. This Sunday, we meet at 9.30 a.m., 11.15 a.m., and again at 6.30 p.m., to worship God. You can also join us on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock as we come and have family worship service together. Thanks so much for tuning in today. If Jesus is not Lord of your life, this is the day to make him Lord of your life. Just say, Father, I want you to come into my life. I believe that you sent your son to die for me. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Ask him to come into your heart. He'll forgive you of your sins today, redeem you from all your sin, and you can be saved and know you're on your way to heaven today. I encourage you to do that. God bless you. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week right here on the Road Church. Again.